Hey there, back with another celluloid gem. I know it's been a while, I had trouble finding a digital copy, but I've got one now, so here we are. Now, I've seen plenty of Arnie films in my time, but if I ever had to rank these, Red Heat, definitely top five. Probably third behind Terminator 2 and Total Recall, I'm that serious. But it's not one you usually hear. Released in June of 1988, a few months before Twins, which probably overshadowed this film. Now I've talked about body cop films previously in the last Celluloid Gem video. Conventions of the genre that lead to expectations. Explosive action, a bit of comedy, and some chemistry where there shouldn't be. But this is not your average body cop film. Honestly, I see it as much more than that. There is this whole underside to this film which I don't think people realise. This is the recap of Red Heat. but. Before we get into this film, we need to go back in time again. I need to show you something. Now I've talked about the 80s man before. Big and muscly, capable of anything. But they weren't invincible. They had weaknesses and fears. Martin Fradley discusses the decline in empowerment in the great white American man since the 60s. He writes, The masochistic narratives and tortured mise-en-scene that typify the contemporary action film have their basis in wider cultural narratives characterised by a form of paranoia which is itself mobilised and soothed by a somewhat paradoxical emphasis on our narcissistic and performative masculine angst. His statement was supported by Susan Faludi, who addresses tropes of contemporary male paranoia. The list includes the abject horror of penetration, the triad of masculation, commodification and feminization, homosocial betrayal, objectification, and diminished slash extinguished utilitarianism. This list will be important for the recap. Just remember this is in discussion of the American man of Hollywood cinema. Also, one more thing I need to point out. This was 1988. While the Cold War was coming to an end, it was still around, so some tension was still there. Now, onto the film. Now that little piece of score alone already puts me on edge. If I close my eyes and hear that again, I envision a never-ending staircase going down somewhere dark, somewhere unknown. Also, if you watch a lot of foreign films, you may have heard this before. <laughs> Anyways, we start off in a Russian bathhouse. On the right, we see bodybuilders barely wearing anything. And on the left, we see naked women in the bath, which of course I can't show you. Now that's something you don't see in English-speaking countries. In comes Arnie, who plays Captain Ivan Danko. And what an introduction this is. If we forget the fact that he's barely wearing anything, let's take a look at the way he walks. There's no cool swagger. His arms are quite flimsy and lifeless. Your average American character would have some personality in the way he walks. No Hollywood influence here. Contrasting with some sort of European otherness behavior, Anyway, he meets some men in the back, staying completely silent as he listens on. To prove that he's a foundry worker, I think, he's forced to grip a hot stone in his hand to prove that he's used to the heat, and out of nowhere, a fight begins, with all fighters getting thrown out into the cold snow. Definitely not a scenario you'd see in the western world. After Danko wins the fight, he then proceeds to interrogate one of them. Okay, I've really got to emphasize again just how un-American the situation is. Just near on naked in the snow, and not even a single complaint about the temperature. You know what I mean, just like, oh god, I'm freezing my ass off. You know, I'm, sh I'm sure Russians are more used to the cold, but also, no one-liner. It's just, got the information, and then just, end of conversation. Then comes the introductory sequence. Your average shots around Moscow. Supposedly one of the first American films to shoot in the Red Square. The film crew were actually denied permission to film there, so they had to sneakily film the Red Square scene with less crew to give off the impression that they were making an amateur film. There are a few shots inside Danko's house, I assume. Two things are noted. He has a parakeet, and Danko's watch beeps loudly when it's time to feed it. The watch is actually important for later. After it's over, the film introduces Danko's partner, Yuri Ogarkov, played by Oleg Vidov. 
While he was shown at the start, it was never really clear who he was until now. We get a bit of story world information. There's been a huge increase in drug related crimes over the last 10 years. Following the information gathered at the bathhouse, the police surround the Druzhba Cafe in an attempt to apprehend Georgian drug kingpin Victor Rosta. In the cafe, not even a radio that plays the latest tunes. The moment he walks in, everyone starts looking at him. Really tense atmosphere here. We, the audience, don't even know what Victor looks like. Feels like anybody can jump out at him. Walking towards the far end, we find Victor Roster, played by Edo Ross. But listen to this guy speak. What a dark, lifeless voice! It's as if he smoked heavily, got throat cancer, survived, and just still continues to smoke to this day. After asking for evidence from one of his goons, Danko knocks him to the floor, and out of nowhere, rips off his leg. But it's okay, it's only an amputation. Here we get the infamous one word. Cocainum. A shootout commences. The police storm in. Victor and another goon escape, who's actually Victor's brother. Doesn't look similar, probably from different fathers. Family, eh? Ogarkov goes after Victor while Danko goes after the other one. The brother gets surrounded by police from one side and Danko on the other. Instead of surrendering, he tries to kill Danko, but fails and dies. Somehow, he misses the first shot. Meanwhile, Victor is almost clear of the police, but Ogarkov manages to catch him by surprise. As he gets out his handcuffs, Victor pulls out a small secondary pistol and kills Ogarkov. And Victor escapes after that. At Ogarkov's funeral, his superiors tell Danko that Victor fled the country with two other men, known as Josip Baroda and Pyotr Tatamovich. Moving forward to Chicago six months later, Victor is already making deals with another kingpin known as Abdul Elijah. This isn't him, he's just a courier. I believe his name is Selim. The deal requires two things, a key and half a hundred dollar bill. Selim takes one half of the bill while Victor keeps the other. This is also where we get to see Baroda and Tatamovich. Now we're introduced to our main American cop in the film, Art Ridzik, played by Jim Belushi. You think she bought those? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think those are homegrown. Yeah, those are definitely homegrown. Art. Just an opinion. He's on an assignment to arrest multiple members of the Cleanheads, part of Abdul's gang. As you can tell, he doesn't get along with his superiors, especially the lieutenant here, played by Lawrence Fishburne. His partner, Max Gallagher, is played by Richard Bright, the one who has to keep Ridzik under control half the time. When they breach the apartment, lots of drugs and money laying about. It all seems like a clean assignment, but one of them is packing a shotgun and attempts to flee via an outside stairwell. But Ritzig manages to sneak up behind him. Freeze, motherfucker! You look like Marvin Hagler to me. I lost money on Hagler! So, how can we describe the character of Ritzig? Well, he's a bit whiny, a bit mouthy. He talks too much, to the point where it annoys other characters. Obviously, a cop is your average role for the 80s man, but Ritzig doesn't have that cool, macho-y attitude, nor does he have the muscular body for it either. Because Salim was one of the men arrested, this puts a halt into Victor's deal, as they were supposed to meet later that day. Meanwhile, in Moscow, the police have located Victor and his overall plan to smuggle drugs back from America. Victor was arrested for simply running a red light. Danko is asked to bring him back, but is ordered not to tell the Americans anything about Russia's problems or how dangerous Victor really is. For some reason though, the report is in the Latin alphabet instead of Cyrillic. Apparently this is a factual error according to IMDB, which makes sense. And of course, Russians have their own stereotypes on Americans. America. America, da. Chicago. Gangster. <laughs> When Danko touches down, Ritzik and Gallagher are there to meet him. How you doing, honey? Blow yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good thinking. Already off the bat, it's just socially awkward. The American small talk doesn't go down well with Danko. First time in Chicago? Yes. You have a nice flight? Yes, fine. You hungry? No. Thirsty? No. I hate to break up this romance, but uh, I'm parked in a red zone. No offense. 
On the drive to the hotel, Ritzig at least tries to have conversation. Why do you learn to speak English so well? Army. Compulsory training. Language school in Kiev. Oh, yeah. That's like uh, as in chicken Kiev. Yeah, we had that at my sister's wedding. He does, however, get interested into why Russia brought a captain over to send Victor home, because, after all, they only know about the minor offence here. But Danko just stays silent. Instead of taking him to the expected hotel, Danko insists on dropping him off at the hotel Victor was staying at. A rough-looking place. On checking in, he insists on getting the same room as Victor. Upon entering the room, it's what you expect, really. Not the cleanest looking place, but it's these dim yellow lights and the green neon light from outside that shine on objects in Danko's face that further emphasize the dirtiness. I mean, green does have nauseating connotations. That's why a sick person is portrayed that way in color. There's even a TV where you just have to put in a coin just to watch some porn. Capitalism. The next day, Danko is taken to the station. Observe how crowded it is. Gallagher puts it nicely. When I first walked in here when they assigned me to this district, I thought all hell had broken loose. Nope. It was just a typical Monday morning. Danko meets with Commander Lou Donnelly, played by Peter Boyle, who tells him the details about the arrest. Victor never asked for political asylum, which is odd, considering he probably knows he'll be executed if he gets back. Danko arrives at the city jail and meets Victor, and the reunion is fantastic. Upon checking his personal belongings, Danko finds the key. When asked about the details of the key, Victor refuses to say anything, even to the Americans. Where is the locker? that this key opens. What do you say? He say, go and kiss your mother's behind. Ritzig is a bit of a hothead, isn't he? I think that's enough to analyze and compare the two characters. Now, conventionally, the 80s man is a cool, American, muscly hotshot with one-liners. Danko definitely has the body of an 80s man, but since he's Russian, he doesn't have that cool attitude and hilarious one-liners. Ritzik, the American, can be witty, but at times he's a bit too annoying around others. And again, he doesn't have that muscular body either. Anyway, as the team are about to leave the jail, the music tenses up again. Four men get out of a security van. They enter the building. At this point, Ritzik departs, but is still inside. The four men approach Danko and Gallagher and knock both of them down. Gallagher attempts to shoot one of them, but is shot dead himself. Victor quickly searches Danko for the key, but Danko manages to hit it out of his hands. Before he can go grab it, Ridzik arrives and manages to shoot one of them, but the other three escape with Victor. They get into a car driven by Baroda and drive off. Ridzik chases after them. Meanwhile, Danko crawls towards the key. He manages to grab hold of it before eventually losing consciousness. Later, Danko is taken to the hospital with a concussion. The lieutenant and Ridzik are there too. Ridzik believes it was the cleanheads, which is possible because they were freed yesterday morning by a legal warrant. Also, this one in particular has the same facial hair as the guy with the shotgun. They also begin to suspect that Danko is hiding something because the guy Ridzik shot was Russian. In fact, it was Tatamovich. A member of the Russian consul in Washington and an agent arrived to ask Danko what happened. After Danko tells them the main gist, they scold him for letting him escape. But look at this extreme angle. A big close-up of the agent, like he's up in Danko's face. The comparison in power in this situation is demonstrated very well, but Danko doesn't care. Also, what is it with Russians and croaky voices? Despite Danko's situation, he still has something important. Danko still has the key. And remember, no key means no deal for Victor. Ritzik tries to talk to him about Victor, but catches him with a gun, which reveals that Danko managed to sneak a Russian gun into the country. Danko still plans to find Victor. At this point, Ritzik is assigned to Danko's minder. Back at Donnelly's office, the commander tells Ritzik that despite being a material witness, he won't be taken off the case, acknowledging his personal feelings in the matter regarding Gallagher. When Danko is called in, the lieutenant goes through Victor's file which he got from the Russians. 
Victor's father was tried and hanged for burning villages and raping women. The lieutenant also reveals that they now know that Victor is a bigger threat than they thought, as he's wanted in the USSR for murder, kidnapping, rape, extortion, currency speculation and drug dealings. Danko admits to being told to keep silent, but insists that he will not leave this country without Victor. Don at least somehow allows him to continue, but under two conditions. These will be important later on. One more thing, Captain. I don't want the press to get near you. And I don't want you rolling through this town like the Red Army. The lieutenant objects, but Donnelly assures him that everything will be fine. Because if Danko finds Victor, good. But if he gets into trouble, he has no ties to the Chicago police. He's Russian. And Ridzik getting into trouble is common. He believes it won't ruin the department's reputation. A snitch who helped out in the cleanhead arrest is in the station. Ridzik thinks he might be able to get more info on Victor. Before questioning, you'll notice Danko's juxtaposition and total misunderstanding of US law and protocols. This is Ritzig telling Danko about the Miranda Act. In this country, we try to protect the rights of individuals. It's called the Miranda Act, and it says that you can't even touch his ass. I do not want to touch his ass. I want to make him talk. The snitch goes by the name of Streak. He gets pushy about legal rights, and immediately... Oh, Where is Victor? What the fuck are you doing? Will you be civilized? The interrogation doesn't really go anywhere. Ritzik secretly smuggles heroin onto Streak to make his situation worse enough to get him to talk, but he sees right through it. After more legal jargon from Streak, Danko takes control. No! No! Shit! Okay! Abdullah Lys just running the deal from Joliet. Shit's coming in in a couple of days. I don't know where. Oh, I swear on my balls! I don't know where! <laughs> well, what do you know? The case progresses when the Russian takes control. Hmm. Keep that in mind. To learn more about this deal, Danko goes to meet Abdul Elijah. Despite running one of the biggest criminal organizations, he's in prison. When talking to him, Danko learns that the key holds Victor's money for the deal. He also learns about the whole half a hundred dollar bill thing. Danko tries to negotiate with Elijah to try to get Victor, but you see, Elijah has principles that he doesn't want to break. Even when threatened with removing his testicles and eyes, he won't budge because one, he claims to be a holy man so he doesn't need testicles, and two, he's blind. Not wanting to break principles, the only thing that Elijah can do is arrange a meeting for both Danko and Victor to meet and settle things. Elijah still wants to make the deal happen. Upon driving away from the prison, that information about Danko's watch and his parakeet is brought up again. What's that? My watch. It's on Moscow time. Time to feed Barakit. What's that, Russian for jerking off? What's wrong with Barakit? Nothing, I didn't say anything's wrong with Barakit. My kid sister used to have a Barakit. Do you think that Barakit is feminine? Did I say that? I didn't say that, did I? Later on, they meet Victor's American wife, Kat Manzetti, played by Gina Gershon. She tells him that while Victor was in jail, he told Kat to go collect something from his hotel room, which turned out to be a passport and half a hundred dollar bill. She gave it to a friend of Victor's, but doesn't know who it was. Probably one of the two Russians. But she refuses to say anything else. Danko speculates that Victor used a false ID and a marriage to get a travel visa to the US. They plan to use Kat to get to Victor, but she knows they're onto her. While in the car waiting for Ritzig as he's getting something to eat, Danko writes down the code on Victor's key. This is important later on. Shortly after, some guy threatens to beat up the car because it's parked in his space, and it's here where Danko uses his newfound knowledge of the Miranda Act. Do you know Miranda? Never heard of the bitch. Holy Ghani. About a minute later, after Ridzik comes back, Kat exits the building and gets in a taxi. Danko follows. At this moment, Ritzig faces a trope of male paranoia. Wait, 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 wait! God damn it! Jesus Christ, I just burned off my dick! In a non-metaphorical sense, emasculation as an act is the removal of a penis and testicles. Obviously his dick is still there, but Ritzig over-exaggerates the situation. Salim is actually the taxi driver. He leads Danko into a car park where the cleanheads are waiting. With rifles, I might add. Danko quickly gives Ritzig Victor's key. Kat reveals that this is the meeting place that Elijah set up for Danko and Victor. With both of their guns confiscated, Salim holds Ritzik hostage while Danko sees Victor. It's okay though, because not even Victor was allowed his gun. Principles, I guess. It's obvious at this point that Victor is using Kat, and even she's had enough of it. I just have to say that the dark lighting here is really nice, representing something you might have picked up already, but I'll tell you later on.
The tense music is also a really nice touch. If they let me have my gun, you would be already dead. They have a talk on how both characters are similar, not in terms of nationality, but how they both follow codes and how they respect courage. They also talk about how they've both lost someone close. The meeting doesn't really go anywhere because Danka will never hand over that key, even when he's bribed. After the meeting, Ritzik is freed, but he's a bit pissed off at Danko for leaving him. I don't give a shit if they did give us the fucking guns back! These are the motherfuckers that killed Gallagher, you know that? Obviously Danko is far from Ritzik's expectations as a partner. So Danko emotionlessly walking away from Ridzik in danger could be seen as a sense of homosocial betrayal because he was expecting him to be a bit more defending of his partner. And we never leave our partners holding their dicks in their hands while some bald motherfucker's got a gun in his ear. They later go to the hospital to talk to Tatamovich, who's just woken from his coma. When they get there, you can already tell something is wrong. Kat is there at the hospital talking on the phone, probably to Victor. She sees both of them and then hangs up immediately. Something is definitely wrong. Tatamovich's life support machine has its alarms turned off. As he opens his eyes, a nurse injects him with an air bubble, and it's here we get a chilling flatline. Doesn't that send a chill up your spine? The nurse leaves just as Danko and Ritzik check the body, and then a chase ensues. Hey! The nurse nearly loses them, so the two split up. Ritzig manages to catch up to the nurse first and holds her up at the entrance. However, Kat steps in and tries to dissolve the situation, like she knows anything. The nurse fires back at Ritzig, but Danko arrives and shoots her, only to find out that she wasn't even a woman after all. Those blood squibs are a bit more bloody than usual. The producers Mario Kazar and Andrew Vajner were renowned for making plenty of violent films at that time. Kat tries to run off while Danko goes after her. He manages to catch up. Wanting to help her get out of the situation she's in, he lets her go. That nurse that Danko killed was actually Baroda, the other Russian. Danko lies to Ridzik, saying she just disappeared. Meanwhile, Ridzik faces another trope of male paranoia. Easy. I love how the camera closes up on Ridzik's face. Seems more humiliating on his part, like paparazzi trying to get an embarrassing shot. Donnelly and Stubbs arrive for more berating following the situation, and Streak's new lawsuit against the department for his almost broken hand. Danko tells the two about the nurse being Victor's accomplice, but doesn't disclose anything about Kat and her involvement in everything. Given the circumstances, Danko has no choice but to surrender his gun he managed to get through airport security, but doesn't rat Ritzik out for knowing about it. Danko immediately asks Ritzik for another gun. Ritzik at first refuses because he knows Donnelly wants a reason to ground Ritzik. After Danko shows a bit of empathy in his situation, as Donnelly is supposedly similar to men in the KGB, Ritzig gives him his 44 Magnum. Captain Danko, you are now the proud owner of the most powerful handgun in the world. Soviet Baturin 9.2mm is world's most powerful handgun. Come on, everyone knows the Magnum 44 is the big boy in the black. Why do you think Dirty Harry uses it? Who is Dirty Harry? Later on, Danko and Ridzig fill out mass amounts of paperwork at a cafe. Already a contrast to the Russian cafe is the jukebox compared to the guy on the piano. The actress who plays the waitress here would eventually become Jim Belushi's second wife in real life. Ridzig tries to have close talk with Danko, starting with his parents. Danko's life is kind of bleak. No wife, no lover. Mum was a nurse but died when he was young, and his dad was in the army but died 11 years ago, and grandparents were both killed in World War II. Ritzik has a sister who is divorced, while both of his parents have already died. At this point, Ritzik manages to realise that the American small talk doesn't work well with Danko. I want to add some trivia for a possible movie mistake here. Tea, please. Uh, in a glass with lemon. Right? Yes. Yeah. I saw Dr. Shivago. Hey, see how Danko did that little smirk at the end there? It's as if he understood what he meant. Well, realistically, I don't think he would have understood that, because Dr. Zhivago was first shown in Russia in 1994, six years after this film. Ridzig drops Danko off back at the hotel. Notice the weather here. It's been quite dark since they met Kat, so it feels like one continuous evening. The rest of the film is dark throughout, plus it cleverly hides the sky when it possibly clears in the daytime. It's probably early in the morning at this point, given the fact that the two have been doing paperwork all night. Danko has gotten tons of messages from Kat, 
How she found out where he was staying, I don't know. One small attention to detail here, which I find funny, is when the receptionist talks about the messages, he has a cheeky look on his face. Considering the hotel is known for hookers and prostitutes, he probably thinks Danko has scored himself a woman. When Danko calls, Kat tells him she wants out of the situation. She tells Danko that the drug deal is happening tonight, and will give Danko Victor in exchange for freedom. Danko promises to do what he can for her, as long as he gets Victor. Before taking a shower, Danko hides the key in a broken light shade, but Victor and some cleanheads were watching him from the other side of the street. Victor and the cleanheads walk right in. After finding the room number, they knock out the receptionist and make their way upstairs. Also, it's not mentioned, but when Danko checked in, the receptionist gave him the room number 302, but now he's moved into another room. Also, that unsettling score is still there. There's a woman in another room watching TV. You'll find out why she's important. Wait, I thought Danko's room was 303 now. Where is he? Danko investigates the commotion. Victor, meanwhile, slipped away. Danko deals with the four cleanheads. He almost gets shot by one of them, but the woman manages to kill the last one, saving Danko's life. When she tells him what happened, Danko realizes that this was a diversion for Victor to sneak into Danko's room and take the key. But Victor is ready for another firefight. Danko heads back to his room, with the woman following because for some reason, she gets nosy? For Christ's sake, woman, just stay in your room or just run. Luckily, there are two ways into Danko's room, for some reason. Danko is about to open the second door when suddenly... Ah, shut up, woman! When Victor makes it out of the room, somehow he misses both the woman and Danko. He's a worse shot than his brother! Victor escapes by jumping out of a window. It's at this point where Danko breaks one of Donnelly's conditions. One more thing, Captain. I don't want the press to get near you. Stubbs and Donnelly are already there, and they know that Danko is still hiding information from them. Now that Victor has the key, he can make his deal tonight. Another misfortune is that Kat's body was found in a river with her neck broken. There's a cool cut to the scene where Kat's face is shown on the news, Victor shoots Kat's face on the TV, and then the film cuts to her lifeless body. At this point, Ritzik and Danko are now taken off the investigation, with Donnelly admitting that he was wrong to let them pursue Victor so freely. Now, this is the part where I tell you why I think this is more than your average body cop film. Don't know if you've noticed, but not a lot of good has actually happened in this film. To list the main bad events off, Victor kills Danko's partner and flees Russia. Victor escapes custody in the US. Tatamovich is killed off before questioning. The case starts to leave a trail of destruction. The hotel is shot up, the press has now got involved, Victor retrieves his key, and Kat is dead. It makes crime syndicates look like they can actually get stuff done. The film is kind of dark, don't you think? Supported by the unsettling score and dark lighting I mentioned earlier. Locations themselves aren't particularly nice either. The hotel looks a bit run down. The police station, while clean in a sanitary way, is overcluttered with crime. Kat's dance studio office is a bit cluttered too, with props all over the shelves in the back and trophies on the window. The hospital, a place of recovery, now the scene of a gunfight, ruining that clean nurse outfit in the process. The morgue, ironically, is one of the brightest and cleanest places. Kat's neck broken and strangled body is at least cleaner than a blown off head or mutilation that would have stained the image. Second cleanest is probably the cafe, but that's a no-brainer for sanitary reasons. To me, the action side, the darkness and violence outshines the body cop expectations. In my opinion, that is how the film should be viewed. Not as a body cop film entirely, but more of an action film. This is what I mean by this whole underside to this film, because most people declare this as like a body cop film. Now when you say that, there's that expectation to be, while action packed, quite funny at the same time. And while this film is actually funny at times, if you look at just the action and only view this as an action film, it's an entirely different experience, and in my opinion, a better one. It's not over just yet though. There's one more lead. 
They still have the code on the key. They go to a key shop owned by Ridzik's former brother-in-law. Danko finds that the key is manufactured for lockers for a local bus terminal. That's where the deal is probably going to happen. At the terminal, Salim is already there. Victor gives him the key to get the money out of the locker. While checking the money is legit in the men's toilets, Victor suddenly walks in. Everything okay, yes? Sure. The stuff's coming in on the 9.30 from El Paso. I trust you. Spread it all over Siberia, right man? Victor takes back the money, so he was going to screw over Elijah in the first place. At least he had principles. Victor meets with a dealer who has the other half of the $100 bill. Here's some trivia. The dealer known as Lupo in the credits is the same Lupo from Walter Hill's last film, Extreme Prejudice. He tells him the drugs are in the luggage. This will then be transported back to Russia. Danko and Ritzig arrive just in time to stop him, but they both want him so badly for different reasons they almost turn on each other. He killed a Chicago police officer. Chicago gets him first. I have my orders. Are you fucking nuts? An old lady gets in the way and a tiny gunfight ensues, with Victor escaping. But how does he get away, you may ask? On one of the buses. Danko takes another bus with Ritzik accompanying him and a bus chase commences. Now this is something you don't see every day. It's at this point where Danko breaks Donnelly's other condition. And I don't want you rolling to this town like the Red Army. Way to go! That was a fucking Chicago landmark! Danko is now fully in control. No American involvement. Let me note something here. A weakness of utilitarianism is that it may require us to violate the standards of justice. With Danko free from American protocols, he wrecks havoc just to end Victor's reign, and Ritzik just has to sit there and watch. And while it may lead to a good outcome, at what cost? Ritzik also notes that there are no cops around to even assist. The Americans are useless. Victor is stopped by a train, which forces him to face Danko head on. In a game of chicken. Now usually when Americans play this, one of them will swerve. But these aren't Americans. These are Russians. Come on, get ready to swerve! Yeah! God damn it, Ridzik. This is what happens when Americans interfere with Russian business. In this film, at least. But it's okay, because Victor still stops. <laughs> Danko, Ridzik, and Victor survive. It all leads to this final battle. I take care of this. But what does Ridzik say to this? Chicago gets him first? We stick together to the very end? What does he say to this? I give up. This whole thing's very Russian. He finally gives up. After all that torture and tropes of paranoia, he admits the whole situation is very Russian. No American can solve this. I say again, the Americans were pretty useless. Danko goes alone to settle the score with Victor in one final duel. <laughs> I say again, Victor is a worse shot than his brother. I'm surprised one of the bullets didn't hit Ritzik. It would have been funny if it did. Did you get him? The final scene is at the airport. Only Ritzig is there with him to see him off. It's a shame though. I would have loved to have seen Donnelly and Stubbs one last time going absolutely berserk over the destruction last night. As a token of their friendship, they exchange watches. Ritzig gives Danko his expensive Rolex, while Danko gives Ritzig the really cheap watch that nearly killed him. One important conversation here should be noted. Ritzig. We are police officers. Not politicians. It's okay to like each other. Given this was near the end of the Cold War, it seemed right to add this, portraying the beginning of better relations. As Danko leaves, he salutes Ridzik from afar, which cuts back to him in Russia. And that's the end of Red Heat. Underrated is not the best word to describe this film, but rather misunderstood. A quote from Arnold himself would describe the film's treatment. It wasn't the smash I'd expected. Why is hard to guess. 
It could be that audiences were not ready for Russia, or that my and Jim Belushi's performances were not funny enough, or that the director didn't do a good enough job. For whatever reason, it just didn't quite close the deal. I think audiences took a look at that poster with the knowledge that it was a buddy cop film and expected too many conventions. They thought it was going to be really funny, with a huge contrast in the two main characters. It seemed that way. However, what people got was a very violent and dark action film, which I think overshadowed the conventions as a body cop film. Plus, the main characters aren't perfect in conventions either. Danko is very un-American, not because he's simply Russian, but also his personality. No cool swagger, no cheesy quotes, nothing. Even the director stated that Schwarzenegger's character was toned down to be more realistic. Ritzig is the American cop, but doesn't have the muscles and he's a bit too annoying and whiny. Keep in mind, I first heard about Red Heat from a four-disc collection of Arnie films. The description on the back of the box never stated that this was a buddy cop film. So I went into this expecting an action film, and my goodness did I get it. Above all the 80s films Arnold made, this is definitely one of his darkest at that time. Only behind the original Terminator. Very graphic, a lot of blood and boobs which I can't show. But the film is more than dark. I see it as also a critique on the flawed American police force and its methods with Ritzig taking most of the abuse through some of the tropes of male paranoia, whereas Danko can fight almost butt naked in the snow and not complain one bit. No American can do anything like that without feeling a bit insecure. It was only until a Russian not held back by American protocols took control that the case really developed in the hero's favour. In a way, I guess it's like The Room, where it must be viewed differently to be amazing. As a drama, it's heavily flawed, but as a comedy, it's fantastic. With Red Heat, as a body cop film, I can see why people may find it average, but as an action film, it shines in its own way. The film had multiple deleted scenes. The chase between Danko and Victor after the hotel fight was supposedly extended. Before Kat's death, she gives the police a location on a deal Victor was supposed to be at, but it was revealed that Victor gave her false information. The police were probably so focused on the false information, it could explain why there's no cops during the bus chase. Another deleted scene was in prison, with Danko having to prove himself before speaking to Elijah, by lifting weights and fighting gang members. I can understand why this had to go, because Danko's character needed to be toned down. Novelization of the film included all deleted scenes, however I couldn't get access to it. I think I've covered everything, so I'll end it here. Hopefully this is shorter than the other Celluloid Gem videos. I would highly recommend this film to anyone, but I must emphasize one last time. I recommend this not as a body cop film, but a dark action thriller. And with that being said, I'm going back to my porn. <sighs> yep, good old capitalism indeed.